For our next panel, we've gathered some of the top executives from across the industry. The title of the panel is Analyzing Trader Activity, Where is the Alpha? Today we have our wonderful moderator here, Stephen Hatsakis, Global Director of Online Broker Research at ForexBrokers.com and StockBrokers.com. Our panelists will introduce themselves in a brief moment, but I'll first give them an introduction. We have here today Patrick Reed, co-founder of the Adamus Principle, Mambu Narani, CEO of Quant Insight, Andreas Thalassinos, Director of Education at Naga, Yuri Rumbam, CEO of TipRanks, and Tony Baring, consultant and trader. Let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Okay, mic works. <laughs> Um, so this is a complex topic, you know, difficult to cover in 40 minutes, but we're going to try our best. Looking at uh, where the alpha is from both a broker's perspective as well as from a retail trader's perspective. Um, obviously, you know, with brokers continuing to invest in, you know, building out their platforms every year and balancing the ease of use factor with, uh, you know, the increasing product complexity with things like crypto and, and research increasingly being tailored uh, you know, to help them succeed, we're going to focus on the new trends uh, in terms of how brokers are trying to help their clients make money. Um, obviously, there's a potential conflict of interest that needs to be managed there from time to time. Uh, but we're going to discuss the shift from uh, attrition to basically AUM as uh, brokers you know, want their clients to stay loyal and stick around and have more money on deposit. Uh, so again, it's a challenging topic, but we're going to try our best to, to make through it. Um, and the first question that we thought of here is, you know, with the extreme returns in the market from uh, you know, stocks like Tesla or you know, investing in crypto, how has the aspect of um, trading and investing uh, merged a little bit where it used to be a different type of trader, but now it's they're kind of like converging, especially with things like uh, you know cryptocurrency investor investing where people are buying and holding and not just trading. So uh, with that first question, I uh, thought I'd pass it to Tony here. Oh, great. Lucky me. Um, look, I think it really depends. Like when you're talking about this merging of day trading into being investors, I think it really depends on the individual. It depends on your own individual time horizons. It depends on the product that you're trading. Now, if I look at my own trading, I tend to concentrate around foreign exchange. I tend to be a day trader with that, but then I'm also an investor. So I think it's possible to have a hybrid model. Um, look, there is the availability of leverage and the changing nature of the market as well. And I know that we're going to talk a lot about crypto today. Um, look, I, I've, a couple of my very good friends are actively involved in that crypto market. Now, they, when they were trading foreign exchange, had a time horizon probably no more than about 10 or 15 minutes when they were actually doing that trading. Now they're buying and holding crypto with a view to hold it for the next five years. Now, that sort of changes the nature of their portfolio, the risk that they have in that portfolio, and also to how they look at their returns as well. And, and Patrick, uh, where do you see this going from a broker's perspective as well, as well as the mentality that traders have when they look at investing versus trading? I, um, I think the lines are, are blurred, but there are actually sometimes no lines now. And I just feel that, um, you know, about two weeks ago, I got interviewed by the Daily Telegraph talking about my allocation in Bitcoin. And I just feel that um, I've worked with some PMs. And I think if you're a retail short term day trader, or if you're long term, you've got to put, uh, put it all into perspective of a, of a, of a PM. And you've got to be properly nimble, properly uh, flexible, and adapt to the markets as well. So I, I've got a healthy interest in EM. I, I, my background's futures. Um, so I know about vol. I know about WTI May contract. I know about NASI futures. I, you know, um, and, and everything has risk, right? So and as Tony was saying, it's just like, how much risk are you willing to take for the reward? Where's the asymmetry? And I, I'm fairly agnostic. Certainly, I'm, I've got some skin in, in Bitcoin, but I'm not. I don't think it's the second coming. You know, it's not going to change the world. In 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 my world, when I'm looking for alpha, it's just another asset people want to buy and sell. 
Yeah, I think that's a good point, Patrick. I think being agnostic around the product itself is quite important. I think looking for those trading opportunities, obviously if you're looking at euro dollar and it's trading in a 70-point range, it's not as appealing as trading Bitcoin that moved 8% yesterday. Now, with that volatility, does there's obviously more risk. You know, you're talking Bitcoin's got a volatility of 50, 60 vol versus euro, which is around 6.5. So... You know, obviously you've got to balance that, but I do think, like, if you if you are a trader, having some assets in a risky portfolio do make sense. But betting everything on the ranch, like essentially betting everything on one product, seems a little bit risky. In my not in putting my all view. your money into a meme coin that just came out a few yeah, weeks ago. Yeah. And on that note, you know, a lot of brokers are launching more and more, uh, you know exotic products. Uh, it used to be exotic currency pairs. Now you have exotic uh, cryptocurrencies. And uh, with more and more brokers all extend, expanding their range of markets, not just shares and um, other asset classes, but expanding the crypto uh, pairs. Um, and I don't want this panel just to focus on crypto, but I'm using this. You know, we could, we could compare it to the Robin Hood effect and, uh, you know, the GameStop kind of mania and the, the effect of the crowd. So, like, uh, Mahmoud, for example, where do you see, um, is this the new normal or uh, just a fleeting trend where there's no fundamentals kind of causing the stock to move and it's just literally the crowd sure. coming in? Sure. Well, it sort of ties into this trading versus investing um, question as well, because I think you can separate this out. As far as investing is concerned, there's a very long-term trend. It's been around about 15 years, and it's the shift from money going into active investing, where you pay somebody to manage money, to passive ETFs and do it yourself. There's about one and a half trillion of AUM that's moved from active to passive in the last 12 years. The most important financial decisions anyone will make is buying a house and investing for your retirement. With life expectancy growing uh, and getting longer, that long-term secular trend of people doing it themselves because they're fed up of paying the high fees to asset managers, that's just going to keep going. Then you've got a second aspect, which seems to be almost you know, this trading world, the gamification of trading, the dopamine hit, you know, lot, epicenter seems to be sort of California, where it, a lot of it started off. Uh, and that's driven by easy access, Robin Hood, and that is growing incredibly fast. Uh, and the thing that's really interesting when you look at Reddit, GameStop, Wall Street bets, that the whole phenomenon we've seen, a few things stand out. One is that I'm pretty amazed at, and I don't know where it comes from, but the hunger and interest um, amongst 16 to 24-year-olds um, about financial markets. And I'm also amazed at the level, level of sophistication that I'm picking up when I speak to 16 to 24-year-olds. Uh, and yeah, I come from the hedge fund world. I work for Bluecrest and Millennium and all the rest of it. Uh, and I'm completely amazed. I, so I don't know where that interest is coming from, but I don't think it's a short-term phenomenon. I think it's, it's going to stick around for a long time. Now, it's hard, if not impossible, to split out how much of this is a bull market phenomenon. Would it be as active if, you know, everything crashes in three months? Probably not. Um, but there do seem to be some long-term markers being put in place, the sheer size of... The growth, I mean, in the U.S., in the last six years, there are 50 million new trading accounts with at least $2,000 in them. That is just incredible growth. It's like the next generation of traders are coming in. Absolutely. And, and they're, you know, they've got access. They've got more information than you could have dreamed about 10 years ago, even as an institutional you know, hedge fund or asset manager, portfolio manager. And they really want to play. But, but back to the responsibility of the brokers to kind of, you know, offer them tools to help them make money, right, which is the goal. Uh, there's some responsibility for what products they're endorsing, whether it's adding a new token or, you know, range of securities, uh, and then how that ties back into the research. Like Yuri, for example, you know, uh, with the crowd and this effect of Robinhood or Reddit, uh, social trading's been around for a long time, you know, signals, uh, but I feel like that's start, starting to converge with um, these trends. And where do you see uh, that going, you know, over the next 
couple of years or further out? Right, thank you. So uh, when you look at the big asset managers, such as uh, uh, Mahmoud mentioned in, uh, in the US, you see that they rely more and more on what is called today alternative data sets. So the big portfolio net managers aren't necessarily looking only on charts. They're looking about information that isn't available online. It can be satellite images, website traffic analysis, social media analysis, crowd sentiment, news sentiment, and all that. And uh, what we're now seeing is a trend of brokers who are trying to extend the lifetime of their users. And the way to do that is to give either good research to help your users diversify their portfolios. And I believe that we would slowly see the alternative data trend shifting into the retail space as well. Like with personalization, for example, uh, with, uh, you know, t like, oh, clients who have read this have also read this other well, report, uh, or maybe depending on what's in your watch list, tailoring. Well, well personalization is, uh, is an example of how to improve a user experience and easily onboard users to your platform, but it's not just that. It's uh, making unique data sets that are valuable to your users and are currently not available to retail investors, either because they're expensive or because uh, our regulators don't know how to deal with the retail side of them. Uh, but at some point, this will happen. It's slowly happening, like crowd wisdom, I mean, uh, uh, and copy trading, what we've seen eToro do uh, 10 years ago, and now you see it become more and more popular. That's one side of it. But, you know, how do you, if you want to suggest your users to diversify their portfolio and invest, for instance, in stocks, not just in FX or in crypto, you need to give them information. Right. And, you know, one way to do it is to let them read uh, 50 items on, let's say, Coinbase. Another way to do it is to simply analyze all of the news for them, summarize it, give them an overall sentiment, make it easy for them right. to make an investment decision. Don't give them an advice, but give them access to simply data. Filter the noise, basically. Yeah. Actually, Yuri, I've got a question for you regarding this uh, data. How do you actually put a value on it? Like, how do you price it when you're actually going to be selling it to these end users? That is, a, that is a great question. And, and, the, and because this area... So, you know, when you go to a hedge fund, it's very easy to price it. You have pricing ranges, right? And um, you usually get paid as good as your data is. When you go to retail investors, it's less about how much alpha is in the data. It's more about how much engagement is around the data. And so uh, when we work with online brokers, we would usually price it based on the number of active users. But I believe, and you know, that's why I find this question interesting, that the entire pricing structure will change over time based on the type of data and the value that the retail investors can actually measure. So uh, no money back guarantees yet? <laughs> no, not yet. What about Twitter? I feel like, you know, it's changing in the sense of uh, the market reacting more quickly to it nowadays with certain assets, you know, Tesla, <laughs> Bitcoin, or, or not really Bitcoin, uh, I would say some other tokens, uh, but what are your views on how Twitter is becoming more important, or? So, it's, uh, what I found shocking is that uh, on a survey that was done to Robinhood users in the US, it, was, it, it showed that 70% of the investment decisions that retail investors are making, now we're talking about small accounts, millennials, uh, but still, 70% of the advice that they're getting, they're getting on social media, which is mostly TikTok and uh, Twitter. And so, obviously, you can make a lot of short-term alpha on it, because if you're following an influencer and he's recommending you to push, you know, to go over a stock, then there's a good chance, and, you know, when he's has, and, and the guy has millions of followers, there's a good chance that there's going to be a short-term impact. But I think that the responsibility that online broker have is to make sure that their users can survive uh, the crash that will someday arrive. Because the problem with retail investors is that, is that they're usually around until they lose money. Once they lose money and they're burned, they're never coming back. And, and you know, we've seen that in 2000 and we've seen that in 2008. Institutionals are, institutionals are gonna stay in the market, but retail investors, we all have family members that are never gonna go near the market because at one point in time they lost money. Right. So if you help investors diversify their portfolio, they're gonna be long-term users of yours. And I think that Twitter isn't the best uh, place to learn out how to diversify your portfolio. Agreed. Andreas, what's your, uh, pardon Tony, uh, just for time, I, I, I want to, I, I want to uh, focus this discussion a little bit more on uh, not just how brokers can help their clients make money, which I think is one of the goals of this panel, uh, but I, I'd love to hear your thoughts first, Andreas, on uh, 
the aspect of social copy trading. I know Naga's involved in that uh, to certain degrees, but also the um, future in terms of, you know, with all the pump and dump going on in some of these promotions where you have some influencer that is, you know, promoting a product because now some brokers are starting to hire these influencers and it just seems like it could develop into a perfect storm. Some people can make money, but at what expense, right? If, if it's at the expense of another investor that comes in later, I feel like a lot of that is happening in the market and some people are making money with it, but well, where do you see that going? Uh, well, um, we're discussing about social trading now and uh, I would like to bring you a little bit back uh, because the feeling of belongingness, the need to belong in a group, goes back many years in history when people look for food, for shelter, protect themselves from wild animals hunting for their prey or enemy attacks. So being a member of a group obviously raised their chances for survival rather than being alone out there. Um, so this human need for belongingness received a lot of emphasis and mentioned by great psychologists like Sigmund Freud. Abraham Maslow placed it in his hierarchy of needs right between the um, esteem level and the safety level. And uh, also later on, uh, Roy Baymeister mentioned that for a group, for this human need to be satisfied, two parameters should be met, conditions should be met. First, the interaction in the group, in the community, in a relationship, if you wish, should be positive, pleasant, but not negative. And the second condition is that these interactions should be on a frequent basis, not at random, and is in a systematic way where the uh, members of this community, of this group, share ideas, share insights for the common benefit of the group. So social trading is nothing else than a community, right? Where traders share their trades, their insights, their ideas, so everybody in this uh, group will benefit. Now, uh, our um, founder and CEO, Ben Bilski, mentioned many times that sharing of traits is the same as sharing of content. It's content because it needs time to be prepared. It needs time to research, time to analyze. And as such, uh, content sharing of traits is rewarded at Naga Trader. Now, there are people we all know that have money, they have funds, they have capital, but they do not have the knowledge, the skill, the expertise, the discipline, the patience, the time to trade on their own. So what do they do? They go to a social trading platform where they can research uh, top performing traders and find one or more than one that match their own trading style. Right. And, and they can follow their trades. On the other hand, of course, we have uh, traders that they prefer to trade on their own they, they want to feel this adrenaline rush, but at the same time, unfortunately, their performance is poor. So what do they do? They diversify. And what do they do? They follow some master traders, some uh, leaders, as we call them, so they can benefit from their skills and knowledge and expertise. I, I think that's an excellent expl explanation of social copy trading. Uh, perfect explanation. Um, of course, it's not you know, guaranteed because I know choosing the best uh, strategy uh, when it's performing its best could be the worst time to choose that strategy. But I, I've seen, you know, platforms evolve with more risk management tools. And, and that, that kind of ties back to my question about how brokers can help their clients make money. Uh, how important is risk management? And maybe, Tony, this is something you want to uh, talk as a trader uh, in addition to any comments uh, you might have on Andreas afterwards. Well, I, I was actually just thinking about it on Andreas's comments then. Um, look, I, I think the odds are stacked against retail investors for the start. Not right from the get-go, it's probably 60 to 70% of retail investors lose money. I'm talking day traders or investors or whatever. Not everybody can make money. We are talking essentially a zero-sum game. It may be an oversimplification of it, but 
this is a very hard business to continually make money in. So risk management comes down to, first of all, I think there's a couple of aspects to it. It's got to fit within your own, you know, your own risk profile. What are you comfortable with losing? Not around what you what you're comfortable with making. It's more about what is your downside that you should be, uh, you know, what downside can you actually handle and still come back and keep on doing it? And one of the other panelists sp spoke about people getting wiped out. Yuri, you know, if they get wiped out, they're not coming back to the table. So I think that's very important. You know, when you're trading something that's really risky make sure that you can afford to lose the money. Secondly, you've got to know what your risk is at any stage, and the risk that I look at is the price that I have to pay to get out of a position if the market goes bad. And I'm not talking the normal spreads in the market where it's trading 0.2 wide or 20 cents wide in Bitcoin. I'm talking when it tr starts trading and it's trading 50 or $100 wide in Bitcoin or $500 wide or even wider, right. because then you've got that extra cost to get out of that position. Uh, Patrick, do you have any idea, uh, thoughts or ideas on what brokers can do to better help clients uh, when it comes to risk management and, you know, so the brokers can make more money as well on those trades? I mean, I, I, I don't want to go into market making too much because that would be a, a totally different panel, but uh, I think you understand my point in terms of how clients can reduce those bad losses. Mm. One thing I would say is brokers need to encourage the traders to do their own work. I educate yourself, right? Because it's your money, put in the work. Um, the guys that taught me ran Goldman's prop desk before GFC. They put in 12, 16 hours a day sometimes. And, you know, you've got no one else to blame, right? So, and also with risk, know your capital, know your margin. How many trades of that margin do you have in you? You know, look at the vol, look at ATR, look at all of that stuff. Look at um, what's what the, the the event risk is. Look at liquidity risk. Look at the time of the day. All of that stuff. You just put put in the work, and then when you're comfortable with that, fear goes away because you can. As Tony was saying, you know where your stop is. Don't be afraid of being. Ne obviously, never move your stop. Don't be afraid of being wrong. Right. But you've got to put in your own work because it makes you feel more comfortable. And you're actually. You know, you can't blame anyone. I mean, I, I'm not against social trading, but it can encourage laziness. And right. this is a tough game. I, I think one, one thing that's really important is you should choose your platform carefully. Because, you know, some of these platforms, particularly if you type in trade Bitcoin now, you, you find there's 300 providers of platforms. But I guarantee each of them have their own separate rules around what happens if the market moves adversely when your stop loss kicks in, how far they can skid you on your stop loss, etc. And it happens all the time where you see these wild price movements because there is no central market here if we're talking about crypto. There's no central market as well in, in uh, FX, but because it's a more mature product, you actually do have a, a greater chance of having a de defined range, whereas you'll get these blips on some of these platforms which are you know, two, three, four hundred dollars above where everything else is traded. So uh, I think you do have to choose your platform carefully. I, th I think there's some low-hanging fruit here for brokers. I mean, take a simple example. I want to trade the S&P 500. It's got 15% volatility. VIX is at 15%. That basically tells me there's about a 40-point trading range that's likely today. Two-thirds of the time, it's going to be a 40-point trading range. So if I'm on a broking platform and I put my stop eight points away, it should tell me you have an 85% chance of being stopped out within the next 25 hour, 24 hours. And then I'd scratch my head and think to myself, okay, maybe I want to halve my size and double my stop. It's very simple. It's very simple. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit. That, and yeah, it is, it is their own responsibility. But if you want to attract clients, you want to help them. That sounds and like an excellent tool. I, I'd love to simple. see. Yeah, I'd love to see a retail broker uh, offer a tool like that because that's something you would see like a quant or a hedge fund use. Yuri, uh, what are your thoughts on, the on this The most trivial stuff? calculation ever. <laughs> Probably, yeah. So, Probability. So I agree with what everybody uh, said here about uh, the need to make research and education available to your users. But again, I think that expecting uh, an investor to go through you know, 20 pages of a PDF or to really learn a lot is a lot to ask. I mean, look at where uh, millennials are today. They're on TikTok, right? They want to see 20-second snacks. So how can you expect someone to go through a 20-page PDF and read a thorough analysis? 
So I think that you know a broker, first of all, should really understand who their users are, what are they capable of, what they're looking for, and to kind of adjust all this education to meet their needs, either to simplify it. And you know, if you're a complicated uh, uh, broker and you're attracting institutional investors, if you're you know the interactive brokers of the world, then sure, I mean, go give all the education and all the research that someone can consume. But you can't expect you know, someone that has a thousand dollars portfolio to actually do his own research. So you need to find the right balance. That's a, that's a very valid point. And I uh, see uh, even sophisticated brokers are making their education kind of easier. They're gamifying it as well with uh, progress tracking or quizzes, you know, trying to make it fun. Because like you said, most uh, younger investors don't have the patience to, you know, read those long reports. So w what are you seeing uh, the most successful traders do in terms of making money? Uh, are they younger or are they, you know, I know it's a difficult so we question. Need to, we, we need to distinguish between traders and investors. The most successful investors that I know are actually buying ETFs, like long-term SPY after 10 years. It's, it's, it's kind of a sure thing. Yeah. Um, traders today are more attracted to charting. And, uh, you know, you have the trading views of the world that offer more and more uh, capabilities on top of that. And I see more and more brokers developing their own charting as well. But I also see uh, the new generation of brokers, uh, of brokers, the Robin Hoods of the world, and they're simply enabling their users to use alternative data. They're simplifying things anywhere from crowd wisdom, benchmarking, um, content. And you know, content, as you said, it can be very misleading. You're gonna bring an influencer, you don't know how objective he is. But uh, from the point of view of a broker, it does create engagement. Right. I was going to say, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Um, education is very important. I know Patrick just uh, spoke about this as well. But, you know, if you're coming into a market, as it doesn't matter if you're a 16 to 24-year-old or somebody with a lack of experience in financial markets, it takes a long time to build up a view of how the market works, but also, too, the tools that you need to be successful as well. Um, look, I think there's a number of courses online. It's funny enough, just before this talk, I showed Patrick a, a, a snapshot of LinkedIn where there was uh, some young guy in another country has been complaining about he hasn't made money trading foreign exchange for four years. He doesn't know how. He's asking people to help him. There is no easy way to be successful in this business. There is no easy way to be a successful day trader. Trying to add alpha, and look, we're just trying to beat the, you know, the benchmark of risk-free returns at the moment, which is close to zero. You know, it's not easy all the time, but I think there are opportunities across a number of asset uh, spaces, not just crypto. Right. Uh, excellent points. And I think the uh, expectations need to be set for these, or, uh, whether it's a young investor or an older one that's uh, not as experienced. Uh, for anyone getting started, they need to have the right expectations on the returns that they could make. Um, because unfortunately, some people are just, you know, like I said, dumping all their savings into some meme <laughs> uh, investment, which is silly. Um, but nonetheless, there's returns to be made, right? So how do they balance social copy trading, research, education, trading oh, platforms? I, I, I think you have to be very wary of following the crowd at any stage in any market because be it, call it social trading or whatever, um, getting caught up in the hype where fundamentals just get thrown out the window. And look, we're probably talking about a number of asset classes where fundamentals don't matter at the moment. But you know, eventually things do come back to, to what really matters, and that's getting your money back, making sure that your counterparties you're dealing with are credible, and I mean by that, if you're trading on a platform and all of a sudden you can't find where your Bitcoin is because somebody stole it from your wallet or the platform that you're using to get your, uh, you know, to trade FX or anything, if that falls over, then you are in trouble, regardless right. of the risk profile of your portfolio. Phenomenal points. Andreas, I wanted to ask you also, um, what are you seeing the most successful traders do on your platform? Is it trading or investing, a little bit of both? It's a little bit of both, actually. But uh, I would like to mention a couple of things about these successful traders. Okay. They have some uh, common characteristics. They are skilled, experienced, um, knowledgeable about the subject. They time their entry they know when to exit the market, either with a profit or a loss, and this is extremely important to know when to exit the market because we hear a lot of horror stories, but they do not 
exit the market because they hope that one day the market is going to go high again, right? I think we touched that topic a few minutes ago. And so it's very important to know when to get out of a market, even with a loss. So they know uh, which markets to trade. They avoid flat markets and they avoid high volatility markets. High volatility is a, a little bit misunderstood in this industry. People think that high volatility is a good thing. It's not a good thing. It's high, highly risky uh, phenomenon to trade a high volatility markets. So they know which markets to trade which markets to avoid trading, and of course they prefer the trending markets. Now, that's why we see uh, this phenomenon with S&P 500, uh, Bitcoin, and the other uh, cryptocurrencies. Now, uh, they practice, they master and they practice discipline. That's extremely important. Discipline is a killer in this, the lack of discipline is a killer in this uh, business, and they control their emotions because they have a trading system, a trading strategy, a plan, a method that caters for sudden price fluctuations in the markets. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, education, client education is key in this business. And when I say client education, uh, I want to emphasize that because I have spent 20 years of my life in this field. Client education, we mean valid, correct, simple and to the point, and uh, so everybody can understand. Not the institutional, not the uh, so-called uh, investors, but this information, this content, this uh, knowledge should be available to understand for everybody. Simplify, simplified. And simplify right. and be delivered Excellent. in a way that the younger generation of traders can understand, like they are used to on social media. Thank you, phenomenal point. And I think that agrees with the trends we're seeing with uh, platforms becoming more minimalist and uh, you know ease of use factor, more kind of Robin Hood style simplicity uh, for everybody because people either don't have the patience to sit there and try to figure it out because um, time is valuable. So my last question to everyone here, uh, I know we're limited on time, we have about eight minutes left. Um, what are the traits of the next generation of traders uh, going to need in order to succeed in you know, the current market? Uh, and also, if you'd like to touch on uh, what brokers can do to position themselves you know, for these trends. And try to keep your answers uh, as quick as possible. Can I go first? Yeah, anyone. Yeah, yeah, Perfect. all right. So uh, the characteristics of the new generation of traders. They are tech savvy, they are digital native, they are daily on the social media, they learn from the social media, they seek advice on the social media, they are comfortable, they are used to it, they, they, are, they trade, they want to trade, they want to make money, their trading amount, their investment amount is small, and they prefer low cost brokers, and put all these together, these new generation together, with a small investment amount, you have a huge group that it should not be ignored, but it should be taken very seriously. Now, the, this new group of uh, uh, traders, they are not like, they're actually men and women. This is the new parameter in the equation. They are men and women. Forget these middle-aged uh, investors in gray suits and ties. These guys are dressed in jeans, t-shirts, hoodies, and tattoos, most of them. So you have to look at them the way they are and treat them in that way and deliver whatever you want to deliver to them so they can understand. Don't so, underestimate anybody. No, 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 don't underestimate because you're going to get out of business, for sure. <laughs> and what I also wanted to say is that um, social media implies social trading where experts, uh, uh, master traders share their ideas right. so everybody can learn, share their trades, so everybody can benefit. I would suggest anyone, uh, if you'd like to continue of this, yeah, feel free to approach the yeah. panelists afterwards. Tony? I'm just going to take up probably a minute. I'm watching the clock there. I'm very cognizant of it. Um, I think one thing that's really important is to remember your place in the food chain. Um, and by that I mean I heard uh, one of the previous speakers up here talking about dolphins and wolves and bears and stuff, and I sort of got a bit distracted. But um, 
in my view, there's sharks and there's minnows. And there's a few sharks and there's a lot of minnows swimming around in this big financial markets place that we have. And you've got to remember if you're a minnow, just remember who you are. Because at the end of the day, you know, making money is not easy. You've got to keep at it. You've got to try hard. But you've also got to make sure that you don't get chewed up by a shark. Excellent point. Yuri? So I think that, you know, if I were to start a new brokerage business today, I would, let, I would do one of the two. So, you know, if you look at North America, most of the money isn't actually where the millennials are. It's not Robinhood that is making most of the money. It's the Schwabs, right? It's the Fidelities. It's, a, you know, the big banks. So either I would focus on that segment, which I think is underrated today, or I would focus on the millennial area. But what I would do is I would figure out a way, how do I, do, how do I retain these users until they're actually generating more capital? And so one of the things that I would do is either enable them to have a saving account, life insurance. I would start offering all these sticky services that will keep them with me until these users are actually worth all the investment that we're putting into them. Excellent point. Ties back to the assets under management that we mentioned earlier. I think to underline a point Yuri has made that I think is spot on, um, the new generation of traders is going to have access to institutional quality analytics and data sets uh, that will narrow the gap. And I think the big trend we're going to see is a further collision between this institutional retail world. Excellent. Patrick, take us away. Um, I think you can be a master of macro and a technical wizard. But risk is your best friend. And I've known, I've mentored and I've been mentored by a lot of incredible macro guys, incredible technical guys, but they fall short on risk. And um, you can be average at macro, but if you really know how to slice and dice, if you're really aware of vol, if you're aware of ATR, if you're aware of all that stuff, then you will survive long term. Excellent point. Um, I guess with that said, um, we can open it up for questions. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Uh, if there's something you were expecting us to cover that we didn't, feel free to uh, bring it up. Or if it's something we've discussed, anything on your mind related to the subject, we'd love to hear some questions from you. Anybody? I actually just wanted to make a couple of points about sure. crypto. And I've heard a lot of conversations out there today. 7,000 cryptocurrencies out there at the moment. Um, there's obviously going to have to be some sort of consolidation at some stage. Most of the trading's obviously going to be done around the top 10 or 15 uh, currency, uh, crypto pairs. Um, look, I think if you're agnostic around the, the, uh, you know, the technology benefits of, of crypto, there are some opportunities, but again, it comes with a lot of risk. Um, I do think, though, like any trader, has got to be looking at all markets just to see their influence, see the correlations between crypto, risk assets, be it currencies, be it you know, bonds, be it equities, etc. I, uh, I, I'd like to add an optional question since we have a little bit of time. Um, even though more brokers are offering crypto CFDs, do you see these margin, traditionally margin-based brokers offering physical crypto like, uh, you know, Interactive Brokers has or companies like Swissquote and eToro, uh, you know, again, traditionally margin-based kind of accounts, but now you could buy the underlying and potentially hold it long-term, which you can't really do in a, in a CFD account because of the interest and the carry. Or is this uh, something that you won't, like, it's, is it a trend that's going to stop or are more and more brokers going to offer that? Uh, I think we just saw an example of the first NDF done in a, uh, in a cryptocurrency just the other day by B2CB, I think it was, or B2B2 or something. Um, the Bit one of BitGo, right? The, the futures ETF? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, well, they, no, they did not, not an ETF, they actually oh, did sorry. an NDF. Oh, uh, like a non-deliverable non yeah, forward. Non-deliverable yeah. forward. Um, obviously, then that gives you an exposure to a cryptocurrency without actually owning it. But again, it comes down to leverage, it comes down to the margin that you can put at risk, so... Yuri, Andreas, yes. thoughts about uh, traders becoming investors by holding assets long term, even shares. A lot of brokers are offering shares trading in addition to CFD shares. Yeah, it's, gonna go, it's going to be a mix of investing and trading. We cannot uh, avoid that. And um, I don't think that everybody would like to be an investor, meaning holding the position for decades. This buy and hold uh, method, I think, is not really 100% here anymore. Yes, you, we can argue that, we can discuss it, uh, like uh, S&P 500 is going to give you an X percentage per year, perhaps. 
But then we can argue that it's better perhaps to buy it uh, at the dip, at the correction. Yes? Right. And um, so this investing and trading is becoming a gray area. They are converging. Right. And um, this is the trend, I think. There's no easy solution. You've got to do the hard work, like yeah. Patrick said, yes. uh, whether it's market timing or the long-term passive. Yeah. Well, with that said, thank you, everybody, and thank you to our panelists uh, for this discussion, and uh, we look forward to speaking with you afterwards. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.